we'll we'll respect the uh, the time and uh, welcome everybody. Good evening, and uh, this is the uh, third of four uh, sessions of the forty first annual winter lecture series, Global Perspectives. And as uh, all of you know, or almost all of you know, the theme for this year is Can Democracy Be Saved? The Global Trend Towards Strongman Rule. I'm Peter Levitoff, and I'm chairing the planning committee, and that's why I'm uh, introducing the, the session today. Uh, we have had a couple of scintillating talks uh, on the in the first two weeks. Uh, you we had uh, the first one on uh, on Hungary uh, and uh, Victor Orban, the strong man there. And then the second week was on Brazil and the former strong man, Jair Bolsonaro, uh, was the subject of that talk. And this week, as you know, we'll be talking about Turkey and uh, President Erdogan. But uh, before we introduce the speaker, I just want to mention that uh, this series uh, has been going on for 41 years. It's sponsored by the Social Action Committee of the Unitarian Church of Lincoln with financial support from uh, Humanities Nebraska and the Nebraska Cultural Endowment. Uh, for those of you who may not have heard either or both of the first two sessions, uh, they are archived and they're available uh, right now on the Unitarian Church YouTube channel. So you can go to youtube.com slash, and this is all one word, Unitarian Church of Lincoln, and you will find them and you'll be able to click on them. And you can tell your friends who, uh, who, who may miss this talk that it will be available within a week or so. Um, remember next week, I want to just say this, that we're changing to daylight savings time on Saturday. So please be sure you set your clocks so you don't miss uh, the fourth and final set uh, lecture in this series, uh, which will be uh, on India and Narendra Modi. Uh, one thing I should mention uh, for those of you who are joining us for the first time is that uh, while your video and your audio is off right now, you do have access to the chat function and uh, you are welcome and invited to not only ask questions, but to make comments in the chat section and our moderator uh, will gather them at the end of the talk and, uh, and present them, read them aloud uh, to our guest speaker. And if there is still time, as we did last week, uh, we'll be able to unmute and, uh, and and talk live. So without further ado, uh, let me introduce to you someone you already know, Professor David Forsyth, uh, who introduced the first lecture in this series and has the, uh, the privilege of introducing our speaker for tonight. So go ahead, Dave. Thank you, Peter. And indeed, it is a privilege and a, and a pleasure uh, to introduce Zara Arat whom I have known for a long time. She is a native of Turkey and did her early studies in that country and then moved to the United States uh, for our benefit and uh, took her PhD at State University of New York at uh, Binghamton. Um, like our other speakers, she has quite a distinguished record of scholarship I would just mention one book. Her book, Human Rights in Turkey, was chosen by the Choice Review Service, a unit of the American Library Association, as an outstanding title. They pick certain uh, publications, which they not only review, but then they uh, can rate them or elevate them. And one of her publications, Human Rights in Turkey, was chosen by choice as an outstanding title. She's been the founding president of the human rights section of the American Political Science Association. She's also been the chair of the Human Rights Research Committee for the International Political Science Association. And she has received the Distinguished Scholar Award uh, 
link to the human rights section, again, for the American Political Science Association, which is the premier uh, professional association for political scientists in this country. So uh, I'm not going to go through a whole list of her publications. Her scholarship is quite impressive. It has been well recognized. Her scholarship has been well recognized uh, by the relevant uh, professional associations. So she really is a uh, distinguished scholar about Turkey, about human rights, about women's rights, about a variety of subjects. Um, she's a, a real scholar with broad reach. And I was delighted that uh, she was available for our series. And we shuffled the sequence around a couple of times. And she was very uh, flexible and very agreeable. And so it's uh, with real um, pleasure and anticipation that I look forward to her presentation tonight on the politics of Turkey and the status of democracy in Turkey, and particularly uh, the rise and uh, the rise of uh, Erdogan. And uh, either fortunately or unfortunately, he's still in power and, and won a recent election. And I suspect she'll have uh, something to tell us uh, about that. So Zara, uh, thanks so much for agreeing to be with us tonight. Thank you, David, for the kind words. And I just have to acknowledge something here that I met David in 1989, I think, uh, at the International Political Science Association, uh, where he established the Human Rights uh, Research Committee there. And uh, I owe one of my first awards to uh, him. He nominated me. I was a very young scholar back then the, for the best paper by a junior scholar uh, award uh, that I presented, the paper I presented at that conference, and I got it. So from that point on, David has become a lifelong uh, supporter. So I appreciate that. I would like to also thank the organizers of this particular event uh, and actually the series, wonderful series, and uh, including me, inviting me uh, to participate in it. And I would like you uh, to thank you all for uh, sparing your uh, Sunday evening and uh, joining us today. Let me share my uh, slides. The um, uh, topic is already given, so I would just like to uh, no. we just tested it. Everything was working, but now I'm not able to move. Okay, maybe this way we'll do. Is it working now for you? Uh, yeah, now I just went through a different way. The arrows are not working for some reason. Um, the focus is going to be uh, the success of the Justice and Development Party and uh, the um, the whose leader is uh, Erdogan. And I'm going to refer to this party as AKP by the Turkish acronyms from this point on, and also try to uh, go through the pattern of change in its discourse and rule, uh, which may tell us about the uh, continuity of this uh, governance and uh, since 2002, this party's uh, governance. But it requires a little bit of a history to understand uh, uh, this process. Uh, so I'll get into the uh, uh, historical and political context in which the uh, AKP acquired power and brought Erdogan into power. Uh, well, very quickly, 
say that the uh, after the First World War, uh, in uh, to fight against the invading uh, uh, countries, uh, a national um, liberation movement started in Turkey. Um, a major leader of this movement was Mustafa Kemal Atatürk, and uh, this struggle was uh, carried on by a parliamentary uh, government uh, established in the parliament was established in 1920 as an alternative to the Ottoman government in Istanbul, uh, which was consist considered to be an uh, uh, accomplice and uh, irrelevant. Uh, and uh, this uh, from 1920 on, actually, Turkey maintained a parliamentary system uh, of some form until 2018, uh, when uh, following a constitutional uh, referendum in 2017, uh, a presidential system is uh, established. And uh, upon the military victory of the uh, nationalists, uh, uh, in 1923, a republic was declared and monarchy was abolished. And a year uh, after, exactly today, actually today is the 100th anniversary, uh, caliphate, the uh, uh, spiritual uh, leadership of Sunnite Islam, uh, which was held by the Ottoman Sultanate uh, since the uh, early 16th uh, century, uh, was abolished. And Turkey became or entered into a secular uh, uh, mode. The, uh, this uh, governance the, or the uh, republic uh, uh, continued as a one-party rule until 1945, uh, then other parties were allowed to uh, establish and uh, they ran for in elections in 1946. And uh, so a multi-party system and in some form parliamentary democracy was initiated uh, then. But this parliamentary democracy was not a strong democracy uh, and also it was subject to some interventions by the military uh, four times uh, uh, again uh, in the course of uh, this period uh, uh, we see the military uh, hosting the elected government and ruling for some time uh, either directly or uh, indirectly through the control of the uh, parliament. Now, it's also important to understand the ethos of the uh, Republican governance. On the one hand, this uh, was a uh, progressive uh, political system uh, and or political leadership. Uh, it was modernizing. It increased some of the, uh, again, uh, freedoms. Uh, uh, invested in public with education and so on. But on the other hand, um, it was uh, preoccupied with state security. And so uh, whatever is deemed as a threat to the state security, the, there was no hesitation in uh, taking some repressive uh, measures. So uh, Turkish history, when we look at it, actually goes in zigzags and sometimes simultaneously we see progress and repression taking place. And as far as threats to the city, state security, three groups uh, are considered to be a major threat. One is religious groups, that, and these would be basically Muslim uh, groups. And uh, religious insurgency uh, considered to be imminent and uh, would be that was expected to be leading to Sharia rule. And um, the so 
Through various mechanisms, these groups were repressed and controlled, and some kind of a homogeneous Islam was adopted by the uh, government, and I'll come to that in a minute. And the uh, second one was ethnic separatism, and especially Kurds uh, was, uh, were considered to be a major threat, and uh, they were... Uh, uh, attempt to be, uh, again, controlled or eliminated through repression, displacement, and uh, assimilation. And repression sometimes took really violent forms, bombing and so on. And the third would be the, it would be communism. And, uh, and this was uh, broadly actually defined, basically the all left as a range of socialist uh, uh, groups as well uh, were subject to uh, repression, persecution, and so on. Uh, now, uh, AKP's main uh, problem with the system or critique about the system is that the uh, this Republican regime has been repressing Islam and discriminating against pious Muslims. This is a valid argument, but it's also a bit distorted. As for repression, it's right that in since, since 1920s, there were various bans on uh, religious groups, their organizations, uh, religious education, private education uh, were uh, banned and some religious outfits were banned. And um, also throughout the period that I just uh, laid out, uh, party closures, when multi-party regime uh, started, uh, pro-religious uh, parties uh, have been subject to uh, closing. And, uh, but there's another side of the coin and that is the, the regime also supported uh, Islam and Muslims. In 1926, the Directorate of Religious Affairs was created and this religious, uh, this directorate funded by uh, public taxes, the, uh, finance the mosques and the clergy, including the education of the clergy in vocational schools. Erdogan is a actually graduate of those schools. And um, it also provided uh, religious education at uh, public schools. And the uh, Dianet promoted uh, a particular version of Sunni Islam. So in that sense, it was controlling, uh, but on the other hand, we have to acknowledge that Dianet served the Sunni majority, Muslim majority, and while all of the other religious groups had to finance their own institutions and education and so on. Also political parties or uh, uh, religious politicians have been active and influential since the 1940s. And uh, political parties, while they were banned, they would reincarnate themselves, reestablished uh, uh, by sometimes by the very same people and under a different name. And they participated in coalition governments uh, for a good portion of 1970s and uh, also in the 1990s. There's another myth I would like to address that the military in Turkey is a staunch, uh, staunch secularist. This is uh, grounded on the basis of the fact that the, uh, the military had taken and uh, just like emphasized or promoted non-religious look by both its in personnel and its own premises and also follow the non-religious schedule. It never acknowledged the five daily prayers and so on and would not operate uh, according to that. And after the 1980 military coup, uh, the uh, coup leaders um, 
introduce a headscarf ban. The uh, in public uh, institutions and particularly in the universities. At that point, actually, all universities were public and free. Uh, the uh, women could not wear headscarf, and uh, also those who are working in government offices could not wear headscarf. And also in 1997, uh, Nejmet and Erbakan's uh, coalition government uh, was hosted by the military uh, with the, again, claim that Erbakan was engaged in improper religious activities. But on the other hand, uh, 1960 and 71 military interventions, military coups, untouched religious groups while they brutally repress the uh, left and including also some liberals, I would say. And also containment of communism was also the a goal of the military and Islam is considered to be an antidote or an alternative to uh, uh, communism. This is actually borrowing the American playbook. I would say that as the United States successive governments during the Cold War use Islam as an alternative to uh, endorse Islam and Islamization of the Middle East as in uh, a part of its containment of communism. And also the military, the 1980 military coup leaders made religious education in public schools mandatory. So I dare say that the military is in a way a midwife of the AKP. Now, a little bit about the uh, background of the uh, AKP. Uh, I already mentioned Nejmet and Erbakan. You see the uh, picture of him here. Uh, he has been an active religious politician since the 1960s, participated in several uh, governments and uh, formed successive religious political parties. As one closed down, he would come back with another one. And Erdogan, I, I'm sorry, Erdogan, Erbakan, too close things, they uh, introduced this notion called uh, Milli Gürüş, national vision. We can translate it as such and uh, promoted a particular governance philosophy. Turkey has certain national values and it should be run according to those Turkish national values instead of following Western uh ideas so there was a pretty strong anti-western uh, uh note there and uh also Er uh, Erbakan or Milli Görüş was against Turkey's membership in NATO Turkey should uh, have left NATO and instead of the west Turkey should get closer to Muslim uh, neighboring and other countries. So pan-Islamism was a part of uh, Milli Görüş and uh, it also promoted uh, in Islamic economics, uh, which was mainly against uh, charging interest, and, uh, but had uh, was presented as an anti-capitalist and anti-socialist, a third uh, alternative. And uh, when Erbakan was ousted from government in, uh, by the military uh, in 1997, his party, uh, welfare party uh, uh, by Turkish acronym RP was closed down, but er uh, Erbakan uh, immediately established another one, Virtue Party, uh, Fazilet Partisi, uh, uh, and then when Fazilet Partisi also closed down in 2001, the uh, Erbakan wing of the party, considered to be traditional, established Felicity Party, um, Saadet Partisi in Turkish, and, the, and another group that constitute the 
uh, progressives who presented themselves as moving away from Mili Gurush and becoming uh, a pro-Western and uh, they call themselves conservative Democrats or sometimes Muslim Democrats akin to the Christian Democrats in Europe. And Recep Tayyip Erdogan and Abdullah Gül, who been since the 1970s, they're uh, actually uh, late teen years, we can say, uh, become uh, a follower of Erbakan, were the uh, a progressives that established uh, AKP. Now the AKP timeline, that is like the AKP enjoyed three major successive electoral victor victories in parliamentary elections. Uh, 2002 elections brought it to power. It had about 35% uh, percent of the votes, but because of the electoral system, there was over-representation. So it had a, uh, a, a major, actually, Gandhi became that there were only two parties that could enter actually in the parliament and uh, AKP was able to establish the government and rule by itself. 2007 brought another uh, electoral victory, uh, the parliament and also the, uh, with a lot of qualms and fights and all of that, if we can say that Gül, Abdullah Gül was elected president by the parliament and but so AKP now controlled both the parliament, the uh, uh, the government, and the uh, presidency. And at the same time, we also see uh, feeling a bit more confident. There are there is this move toward the immediately again in the uh, two thousand seven, the late two thousand seven prosecution of Kurds and uh, persecution of the military took place. Active and retired military officers were accused of, in two different campaigns, accused of uh, uh, organizing another coup d'etat against the AKP uh, government, and uh, they were viciously persecuted. And later on, we came to learn that all of these, uh, actually, the evidence used uh, uh, against these uh, people were fabricated. Uh, but that initiative actually weakened the uh, 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 military and uh, got Turkey close to uh, ending the military tutelage. In 2010, this is another uh, a milestone that um, AKP uh, initiated a constitutional referendum. And this referendum uh, is important for actually marking the beginning and uh, beginning the end of the separation of powers because government voice in the judiciary uh, uh, was institutionalized with this uh, referendum. In 2011, uh, AKP had another massive electoral victory and uh, that gave it more confidence. And this is actually when we see the authoritarian tendencies within the party, not just Erdogan, within the entire party uh, starting to appear and become more visible. And um, two, uh, events uh, that took place in 2013 are important as authoritarianism and imposition of a particular lifestyle on people uh, became uh, more aggressive and uh, uh, apparent, uh, a spontaneous protest emerged in Turkey and um, it's uh, collectively, these are called Gezi protests. It's uh, these protests started as an environmentalist actually movement in the central Istanbul. And then the 
a disproportional reaction to it by the government, uh, made it spread, and Gezi protests constitute a one-of-a-kind protests in Turkey and all around the world, actually. It is widely studied by social movements people because people who have never involved in politics before, never engaged in any political move, uh, movement or protest, participated in this, mostly youth, but uh, from different ideological groups and so on, and without any central organization, it was very spontaneous and it was also built on this uh, uh, in, immense solidarity spirit. Within the uh, Gezi process took place in late spring, early summer. And the, uh, uh, during that time, uh, AKP, uh, started to have a fall off with it is a uh, major ally, Fethullah Gülen, the, next to Erdogan here, uh, and his uh, network. Gülen, is, is a, Gülen uh, network is a murky organization. Actually, I call it as a it's modus operandi as a combination of uh, missionary service, mafia, and cult. And uh, it was instrumental in the rise of AKP. It actually filled AKP ca uh, caters with uh, educated, highly educated, very competent, actually, people. Uh, and uh, during that time, they were in alliance. But in the meantime, we know that Yulenis had their own agenda and uh, was it a power struggle uh, against the AKP. Now, Gülenis in the uh, December, in December of 2013, uh, actually showed uh, uh, or uh, revealed various corruptions by top AKP government officials and their sons. They implicated Erdogan and his son. They shared uh, audio tapes. And also Gülenis at this point, uh, in control of the judiciary to a great extent, started persecuting uh, AKP officials. And Erdogan called this the a coup d'etat attempt by the Gülenis, and they started to clean out the Gülenis from its uh, rank and file. And the, um, in 2014, actually started a bit earlier, but in 2014, after uh, Erdogan was elected for the first time, actually directly popular election took place for the to uh, select the president. Erdogan was elected to the, in the office and without the Gilenis on his back, who were not keen on Kurds, uh, he initiated, started an initiation to bring uh, peace with uh, Kurdish nationalists. But that did not live long because uh, uh, while Kurds wanted such a, a actually dialogue, they um, were not keen on uh, changing the parliamentary system with the presidential uh, one, which Erdogan was overtly pursuing at this point. And um, so giving that conflict uh, and um, also popularity of Kurds, not only among Kurds, but also among some uh, left-wing and liberal groups. And so uh, made Erdogan threatened. And, uh, and in fact, in 2015 June elections for the first time, Erdogan uh, government uh, lost vote and seats. And the, um, it was not able to establish a, a government by itself. And Erdogan manipulated the process, prevented any uh, alternative to say any coalition possibilities and uh, scheduled another parliamentary election for the uh, November of 2015. And in the process, during that process, uh, 
Erdogan and AKP played on sense of insecurity, try to make this make people uh, feel unsafe. So for the stability and security, they should for vote for Erdogan, and uh, it worked, and it got the actually uh, in November uh, had enough votes to establish a government by itself. And during that time, Kurds and afterwards too, Kurds were subject to uh, all kinds of actually repression and attacks and uh, Kurdish um, uh, uh, majority areas in the East were bombed. And here you see a neighborhood in Mardin, uh, uh, the uh, in June 15, and then uh, about a year later, the same aerial uh, photo shows the leveled uh, uh, houses and so on. Uh, finally, in the uh, 2016, we see uh, uh, a coup attempt failed. Uh, uh, Gülenis were accused of that, and I think that has some, uh, they like the truth to it. Uh, but uh, important for our purposes, Erdogan used this as an opportunity to actually declare a state of emergency and used uh, all extra power uh, that the executive branch could carry out under the state of uh, emergency to repress all range of this, like the oppositions, including students complaining, university students complaining about uh, some university policies, financing, etc. And in 2018, as already I mentioned, that following a uh, referendum, Turkey moved into presidential system, another constitutional amendment, and uh, and uh, Erdogan was elected the uh, president. And important about this presidential system is it's one of a kind. It is has extensive powers. Uh, uh, it signs its extent of power to the uh, uh, president. And Erdogan not only uses these constitutional, uh, uh, the, uh, uses the constitutional authority and uh, power, uh, but also doesn't hesitate to uh, ignore the constitution and dismiss the uh, constitutional court decisions. And I should say that uh, there isn't uh, now the institutional alternatives or the no separation of power so there isn't a, a mechanism that would restrain and control Erdogan. Now going back in time a bit the um, uh, things were pretty good at the beginning good old days we have to say that the well first of all it is like if they say that the uh, AKP came to power not at a pretty bad uh, time in Turkey. The economy had hit the bottom, but before the uh, Erdogan, the elections were held and Erdogan and AKP came to power, actually recovery was in place. And actually the AKP government continued with those policies. And uh, also, there were the, the social civil society was vibrant. There were various uh, social movements, women's movements, environmentalist movements, LGBT right movements, and human rights activism was uh, uh, on the rise. And uh, on and off again, it is like the, as it's things happen to be uh, the case in Turkey. The uh, uh, sometimes pretty uh, viable, sometimes a bit, uh, again, constrained, they, it was going on. And Turkey, uh, which uh, started to uh, pursue EU membership in the 1990s, uh, finally uh, officially recognized as a candidate. And so EU membership uh, um, stimulated further legislative reforms, expansion of freedoms, 
and gradual abolishment of uh, death penalty, which finally uh, abolished in 2004. And it was also a relatively calm period uh, with the PKK, Turkish militia, which organized, which was organized in the uh, uh, early 1980s against the Turkish uh, military. And uh, within this context, the first AKP government was established by Abdullah Kül. And uh, that was the case because Erdogan, although he was the uh, head of the party, uh, because of a military, the uh, political ban, he couldn't acquire the position. Uh, but and the Gül government, which lasted for a year, and then the uh, ban was removed, and Erdogan came uh, and acquired the uh, uh, power and became the. Uh, established a second AKP government. Gül's government's program reads like a, a human rights manifesto. And uh, so the AKP was pro-human rights, continued with the uh, pursuing the EU membership and harmonization of the uh, Turkish laws with the EU ones and continue to work with women's groups and carry out some pro-women policies. But I have to say that even when it went with some progressive uh, policies, uh, AKP has always maintained a dualistic approach while promoting women's uh, participation and place in the public life, uh, also uh, believed that main place of women is home and uh, promoted pronatalist uh, policies. Now, what kind of strategies uh, uh, AKP followed and uh, whose supports it garnered? The, uh, they're numerous and I'll go through them very quickly. The um, I, I should, however, stress that these policies, these strategies are used on and off, sometimes together, sometimes in succession, and, uh, and at different times in uh, the course of the, again, the AKP role. Well, first of all, it distanced itself from its radical Islamist past, from Milli Görüş. It campaigned on human rights, pro-Western, pro-European Union platform. It invited and so invited and sometimes co-opted liberal secularists and they took place in AKP governments and different, uh, again, uh, initiatives. It capitalized, this is very important, capitalized on a sense of victimhood. The, uh, and uh, mobilized people around this grievance, uh, their grievances against uh, secularism, this notion that pious Muslims were repressed and uh, uh, treated as secondary citizens and so on. And uh, it invoked Turkish nationalism and also Ottoman heritage to uh, have the, again, the appeal of the nationalists and uh, so. It embraced neoliberal economics. Now, neoliberal economic paradigm was imposed on Turkey by the IMF, at least since uh, 1980, and all governments, successive governments in Turkey follow these, although usually grudgingly, not all that willingly. But uh, AKP uh, governments were the first to actually embrace uh, neoliberalism. And I should also say that economic criteria of the uh, European Union for membership is pretty neoliberal. And within this neoliberal uh, context, when welfare state is uh, dismissed or dismantled uh, and uh, private uh, services are promoted, the uh, 
AKP uh, use charity, clientelism, and selective en endorsement of some public services. And it sought and ended military tutelage, and it initiated peace uh, or undertake peace in initiatives with Kurdish nationalists. And externally, outside of Turkey, it uh, promoted interfaith dialogue and uh, participated in these initiatives called for Alliance of Civilizations, and it supported the Arab Spring. So these various strategies, of course, generated a number of supporters from different corners. And religious conservatives, the Gulenis Network, the rural and urban poor, human rights groups, leftists, Kurds, non-Muslim minorities, business elite, and I should underline here since there's a uh, business elite called uh, uh, green capital, not those groups only, but secularist business groups also supported. Western states and the European Union, Western media, Western academia, and of course, Arab uh, spring activists, as well as the uh, supporters of them. Now, this will be a bit redundant, but I would like to highlight uh, a how these uh, strategies work with some supporting groups and how these groups enabled reinforcing the AKP power. Now, Turkish liberals and leftists always suffered, especially leftists, uh, uh, under various military interventions. So they welcome the AKP's uh, initiatives to end the military tutelage. They were not bothered here, I have to say, that AKP was using some not so kosher and uh, uh, human rights respecting mechanisms in doing so. They kind of turned a blind eye to the irregularities in this uh, uh, process. So this is, I think, actually dark spot on Turkish left. The um, also some, not all, but some leftists uh, and liberals uh, are engaged in a campaign in the uh, 2010 constitutional amendments referendum. Uh, they said they their slogan was not enough, but yes, it's not progressive enough, but we are saying yes. And uh, and then they actually supported within that the, as I mentioned earlier, the increased uh, control of the um, government over the uh, judiciary. And... Um, they also, when they were supporting the AKP, uh, I think a really problematic element was it's, it was not just extending support to AKP, but harsh criticism of the opposition parties. And uh, so they, they kind of had this delegitimizing impact and helped weakening the uh, opposition parties. Kurdish politicians, under scrutiny and a lot of hardship, it's like they say that they, uh, they had to establish a delicate balance in many times. But one, I think, problem and mistake they made was they boycotted the 2010 constitutional uh, referendum. And uh, if Turkish politicians participated or gave the light, uh, green light for their followers to uh, participate in this referendum, they would vote no, and the uh, so 2000 referendum would not be um, uh, successful for the uh, uh, AKP. Um, sorry. The uh, United States uh, considered AKP governance as moderate Islam uh, rule, Islamic rule, and uh, 
thought of uh, it would be a model uh, to be emulated by the rest of the uh, uh, region and uh, other Muslim uh, states. And of course, wanted to secure its uh, strategic military bases in Turkey and AKP was uh, 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 okay with that. And the European Union, Union and member countries had two actually in two ways that is like one is that they resisted Turkey's membership and, uh, and some overtly opposed. And that was something that the AKP and Erdogan in particular could use as another part of uh, victimization of Muslims and so on. And uh, more recently, that is the um, European Union and um, European member the member countries actually use uh, Turkey as a buffer zone to stop refugees. And that's a, uh, a service that Erdogan uh, provides. And then so Europeans can turn a bl blind eye to what else is going on. And over here, actually, visits by Merkel and uh, May uh, important because they came at critical points in Turkish domestic politics just before elections and so on and had legitimizing impact. And May also granted an audience for Erdogan uh, uh, audience with the queen, and that was a big splash in Turkey. Western media and academia, the uh, uh, reduced uh, Turkish politics into this simple, very simplistic binary of uh, two forces, clashing forces, and Within that, the the it was pictured or presented as reformist Islamists and moderate. We have to say that is that against the secularist relics who are stuck in the past and uh, so. And if you go through New York Times and some other again the journals, actually you can see uh, how pro Erdogan and AKP they were. Now, the culminating impact of these facilitating actors and actions is strengthening the AKP and weakening the opposition. And the opposition, I might add, that was has been weak already and a weak in organization and does not offer very clear policy alternatives and fails repeatedly to come up with a united front. And there were some attempts to that, but not very successful, I might say. Now, another thing besides these policy elements, like the political strategies that the uh, AKP and Erdogan uses, I have to stress Erdogan uh, at this point, I guess, um, toward the opposition. That is, there's a within the party. What we see over time that Erdogan removed uh, obstacles to his own power or increasing power. Uh, you see a couple here, you probably never heard of them, and the uh, husband and wife, they were founding members of AKP. She had says headscarf, so she couldn't run for the uh, at the parliamentary elections. But husband was elected in two thousand two, and by two thousand and seven, they were out. They were true human rights believers, and they still struggle actually for the advancement of human rights in Turkey. In two thousand fourteen, Abdullah Gül who was referred by Erdogan as his brother. Uh, they were, since their teen years, they've been friends and so on, uh, was removed. And um, Davutoğlu and Babacan, 
key players in uh, one as a prime minister and uh, one as a, a cabinet member uh, were uh, removed or forced to move out and today now they have their own parties and then the toward the opposition parties they just like co-optation well if again some the, the hopeless ones would be subject to intimidation repression and disinformation but the uh, uh, also some were co-opted and uh the uh, Felicity Party leader that they, they split from the uh, Nejmetin Erbakan's, uh, they were, were when the uh, Nejmetin Erbakan's party was split into two in 2001 as traditionalists and reformists, the uh, chair of the traditionalist one uh, was basically attracted and taken to the uh, AKP and played various uh, uh, you know, significant uh, 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 roles and uh, held positions in AKP. And the uh, uh, nationalist, Turkish nationalist uh, party, uh, which has a very long tradition in Salwan, uh, uh, actually a very uh, harsh opponent of Erdogan uh, was co-opted as well just before the uh, last uh, constitutional referendum that actually changed the system into a uh, the presidential one. And now actually we see a coalition that uh, because without the uh, 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 MHP, the um, Erdogan doesn't have, or AKP doesn't have the majority in the parliament. And of course, public opposition was repressed at every opportunity and the media and press is also uh, repressed and only um, about 10% of the media is really in opposition, 90% is controlled or uh, controlled by AKP or pro-government uh, by choice, maybe we can say kind of choice because uh, uh, they have access to more resources, uh, government advertisements and many other things. So what we can say that today, what we have in Turkey is a facade of democracy. And uh, in 1996, in an interview with a Turkish daily, Erdogan said this, democracy is a streetcar that we take to reach our destination, then we hop off. I guess the destination was reached, so there is no need for democracy anymore. And the... Uh, Another thing, again, this from Erdogan's code, some quotations from Erdogan, uh, after the military coup attempt uh, in 2016, Erdogan referred to it as a gift from Allah, from God. And that is, um, again, the an opportunity for him to undermine democracy and increase oppressive uh, uh, measures and the uh, so one would they say that the destination was reached there is this authoritarian rule control why maintain a facade and uh, why still go for elections why allow some uh, a opposition to the uh, opposition press or opposition parties Although they could, they can be and often uh, are often hit by a hammer on the head, allowed to uh, exist, and um, that is the for legitimizing reasons and uh, also confidence in the electoral process in the say that Erdogan knows how to work the electoral system. He is a really mastermind when it comes to that, 
And uh, with a few exceptions, as we can see, he has been coming up uh, out victorious. And uh, so why change it when you can control it? And if you maintain the electoral system, you can also claim that you have the electoral mandate before you, uh, behind you, and it serves as a justification and legitimizing uh, uh, item. And uh, similarly, again, the existence of a weak but opposition, no matter, again, it's like it has to be kept uh, weak, uh, is another legitimizing uh, uh, factor. So, um, the next question we may ask, why do people support the AKP and Erdogan? Uh, why they have been doing so for uh, this? So the um, electoral support has been declining, uh, but still continuous. And um, now we may say that a segment of population in Turkey is not really that concerned about democracy and freedoms as such. They are more concerned about their economic well-being, security, access to some services, and also recognition the, uh, uh, as equal citizens. But the if economy economic well-being and access to services is a concern, then you would say that, how about these situations that actually did the uh, crush people uh, do not work against Erdogan? The economic hardship, especially in recent years, has been bad. The uh, inflation has been high. Uh, the uh, during the last uh, elections last year, the uh, if, as far as you recall right, it, it was about fifty percent, and uh, today the official number is fifty percent, but these um, experts tell us it is over. That the currency is devaluated uh, tremendously uh, over the years. And uh, there are all of these mining and industrial accidents taking place, causing a lot of lives. And they happen usually because the, uh, they are not run by government, but government inspections and regulations are lacking. And on top of that, the uh, government takes pro-business position instead of siding with the victims. In 2014, for example, there was a mining uh, accident in uh, Soma and 301 miners died. At that election, in 2014 elections, Soma overwhelmingly voted for AKP. Earthquakes last year took, just like the thousands of buildings collapsed, 50, over 50,000 deaths, over 100,000 injured, and millions displaced. And you would expect the, and then again, here we have the zoning uh, issues, building permits, lack of inspection, not implementing uh, earthquake uh, uh, measure uh, policies, which are in, the, <laughs> in law. And not reaching uh, to the, uh, uh, after the earthquake, reaching to these devastated areas on time and not delivering the uh, deeded goods. The, we all expected the, uh, uh, those to have an impact on the uh, last uh, uh, May elections and they did not. The AKP came as victorious in most of these provinces as well. So what we can say that the uh, public 
seems to be distrusting, dis, uh, trusting the opposition. Known evil is better than unknown. There are a lot of complaints about Erdogan and AKP, but they do not result in um, eroding uh, support. Clientelism and cronism works work that the there are a significant number of people that is like who own their position meaning their jobs meaning their status in the society and so uh to the akp and also some benefits they get from the they have gotten from the akp role they compare according to one obser uh, observer they compare how where they are to 20 years ago, and they see they are doing better now. And there is a sense of empowerment among certain segments of the society. And the, the culture wars, a culture war that was inflicted and uh, fired up by uh, Erdogan quite a bit, seems to be, again, working for some segments. And most important, we have to say that this is, there's lack of information. A lot of this information uh, there and public actually doesn't get the uh, proper information to make proper judgment uh, about the overall, again, the situation. And that is because, as I said in 90, uh, percent of the media is uh, pro AKP. Well, maybe we can say that all of these do not mean the end of struggle for a lot of people. They, uh, there is um, a considerable civil society activity uh, taking place still this is like relentlessly people continue I guess they go by Pete Singer's line don't you know it is darkest before the dawn, and it's this thought that keeps me moving on so that's it thank you Okay, we'll jump right into some questions from the group chat. All right, the first one, was Ghul a real threat to Erdogan so much that he asked for the U.S. to extradite him from Pennsylvania where he was living? I'm sorry, can you say it, say it again? Yeah. Uh, was Ghul a real threat to Erdogan so much that he asked for the U.S. to extradite him from Pennsylvania where he was living? Well, uh, he was, <laughs> the, I would say that uh, when I, I said that I refer to Gulen's uh, uh, organization uh, as a combination of missionary service, mafia, and uh, cult, the uh, I should also add something else. The, the, uh, uh, they actually are quite, they've been very sneaky throughout the, uh, probably their organization within the uh, public sector uh, predated uh, AKP rule and so on. And uh, so Gulen and his followers, and at this point, actually, I'm not sure how much in charge he is because he's very fragile. He was very fragile and old. Uh, a, uh, uh, establish a danger. And uh, so, um, I, again, former allies, but are now staunch enemies. So uh, that's why he, he wants, he, he wants the hardship that Gulen has created for him to be paid off, that to be kind of punished. All right. Our next question is, was Erdogan sure he was going to win in the last national elections? Why did the poor earthquake response not hurt him more? Well, I tried to actually maybe the uh, person put that up before my last slide. The uh, I don't think he was sure. And the uh, so he had a very, pretty relentless campaign. 
And one of the things actually the, for the opposition, a lot of misinformation uh, would take place that uh, any kind of closing the, uh, well, I should say that the opposition parties were not able to establish a united right front. There were two blocks of oppositions and the, uh, uh, but um, the uh, uh, chief, um, the major opposition party, uh, Republican People's Party, um, tried to play the kind of a delicate balance between its own, um, uh, what is called a, a table of six, six party alliance and a left a leftist alliance, smaller, much smaller parties, but the pro-Kurdish party wasn't there. And uh, so he, uh, Republican People's Party tried to kind of work informally in, with both of them. And Republican People's Party's uh, some cooperation with the pro-Kurdish party is presented as PKK, the Kurdish militia, uh, militia as supporting the Republican People's Party and trying to get it into power and so, and that doesn't speak well to the nationalist uh, groups within the uh, country. And um, so a lot of misinformation uh, was there. So er Erdogan didn't think uh, that it was a safe bet. As far as the um, the uh, earthquakes impact again, as I said, that uh, people were disappointed, they were angry, but uh, they do not necessarily see that switching to another. Uh, well, this would be a coalition that is the uh, untested for twenty years. Uh, is not going to make their lives any better. So distrust uh, for the in in the uh, uh, opposition parties played a I think played a big role. We will get some better ideas after some surveys and interviews and so on probably, but um, that that is something that we can explain. The other thing is, of course, even if they didn't get certain help, assistance on time. If they need some things immediately at that point, this is like in May, who is likely to deliver them right away? If they, if a AKP already in power, already in control of the state for two decades, would be in such a position. So they probably thought that their chances are better. Okay. Our next question from the chat says, why indeed electoral support? What happens when there is no opposition? Well, I think I answered that question, didn't I? Possibly. Um, people <laughs> tend to ask questions as if they're talking to you one-on-one -on -one sometimes. Yeah. We can go on to the next one. Um, what about the relationships between Turkey and the Kurds and the Armenians? Is the AKP a sort of soft theocracy? What about the hijabs? Why did Turkey block Sweden's admission to NATO until lately? Oh, there are many questions there. The uh, well, um, with Kurds uh, at the moment, not good. The uh, there were periods in the past we would say that there some there were some peace initiatives and all of that. Uh, but one of the things at this point we can say that. Uh, while there are Kurds established a, these political uh, parties to participate within the electoral process, within the uh, uh, within Turkey's political system, uh, a AKP and its current particular the ally uh, military uh, the uh, Nationalist Action Party. A staunch Turkish nationalist would never recognize them as legitimate players. That is, like they are con considered to be 
the political arm of the Kurdish militia. So uh, uh, at the moment, especially given the alliance that AKP has with the uh, uh, MHP, uh, I don't see in the near future any kind of uh, change there. And with Armenia, there was uh, some uh, a actually softening uh, uh, cooperative uh, periods in the early years of AKP. And uh, now at the moment, the uh, a will be, I, I, it, if it's ally or we can even send a kind of a client state, the Azerbaijan, is backed by um, the AKP, I again, going by this Turkic nationalist uh, identity. Uh, what else that there was like the, uh, oh, in terms of the um, uh, NATO and uh, uh, things, well, I think that currently we can describe uh, the foreign policy of uh Erdogan, I'm going to say, is quite pra pragmatic. Uh, it clearly, just like they did, or he clearly uh, uh, wanted to be a not a um, kind of eager participant in the Western uh, uh, alliance and uh, uh, wanted to have more power and flexibility and made it clear that it's not going to leave the uh, NATO and Western alliance, but it's not restricted by it either. So on and off with Russia, with uh, China, uh, with uh, Iran, with uh, uh, Israel, and uh, it actually goes back and forth with uh, uh, never exactly closes ties. And now with the actual what happened in Gaza, for example, the, uh, the, the, the government promoted a lot of uh, public protests against Israel. But does it actually take a real position worldwide against Israel? No. Uh, so uh, it is... Uh, again, this relations with Russia went back and forth in different ways. That is like the uh, on Syria, regarding Syria, they're on the opposite uh, positions. On Ukraine, the uh, uh, Turkey sells drones to Ukraine, but does not really uh, implement sanctions against Russia. So um, it is very pra pragmatic, I would say. And there, there are no real enemies. There are no real uh, uh, allies in a way. Uh, and they are usually played, again, this uh, almost like a real politic, what, what benefits Turkey and what benefits Erdogan and the government in particular. Okay, our next question is, is Turkey a member of the EU? Turkey uses euros. It is a member of NATO. Doesn't that kind of require Turkey to preserve democracy, at least the appearance of it? Turkey is a member of NATO, but not a EU. Turkey attempted to become an EU member and worked on it uh, uh, vigorously in the early 2000s, but uh, EU actually had a cold shoulder and uh, uh, so technically, candidacy was not dropped, but it's not pursued uh, anymore. Uh, and the uh, it doesn't use uh, uh, euro. It is uh, as Turkish lira. That's as I mentioned that in, it actually lost value tremendously due to the economic problems. Uh, uh, so. Uh, that that is a situation then as i mentioned my just like I, I don't think turkey would in the near future withdraw from nato uh it's two uh consequences would be too 
uh, complicated and not to be risked. Uh, and membership is frozen, dormant, I should say, that is uh, at the moment. Membership to EU. Okay, our next question is, soft democracy, where are we going? Who is a real opposition leader with some oomph? I'm not sure if I understand the uh, question. Soft democracy or diplomacy, is it? Democracy, yeah. I, again, some people respond in the moment as you're speaking. I, see. I, I, I don't know if I use such a word, soft democracy. There is no soft democracy. There is what I call facade of democracy. The, uh, and um, uh, actually the... Um, Economists uh, in the 2023, uh, uh, the journal Economists uh, Evaluations, uh, listed Turkey as a hybrid uh, regime uh, because it is authoritarian. One is a bit uh, it's like, but I think it is uh, just because there are, again, the elections and just because there is some opposition news outlets and a few parties uh, who can speak up now and then and all of that doesn't mean there is democracy. So it is, I, I see it more of a facade than it's a, actually an authoritarian system with some, some, demo, some freedoms and some democratic elements. Okay. Our next question, is there open access questioning of the government? Uh, yeah, the in a way that the uh, there is a parliament and there are opposition parties in the parliament and the opposition parties uh, pose questions at the parliament, try to hold government accountable, but government doesn't feel the obligation to respond and there's no mechanism to uh, uh, work it uh, again better. And in public, that is like, well, one of the things maybe I should uh, <laughs> disclose this, I am not just a human rights scholar, but I am also a human rights activist and I do so in the United States and in Turkey as well. Um, so, there are petitions signed, there are uh, public statements made by uh, civil society organizations, by opposition uh, parties and so, and uh, government hears them. And sometimes if they think it is necessary to kind of uh, push them back, they have the uh, a, a court system. They use the court system against those people to silence them. But um, some other times they actually just let it fly and they don't take it seriously. And public at large is not able to hear them because they don't uh, watch certain news uh, uh, TV channels and read certain papers. Uh, they uh, they're blocked. Right. Next question. Oh, and I just ask you that one thing, Andy. <laughs> just before last year's elections, there were a lot of these street interviews, certain like on TikTok and some other places, people would post these interviews. And it's amazing to see how many people on those interviews hold the uh, uh uh, chair of the um, main opposition party leader responsible of all of the ills in Turkey. And the um, the journalist says that, but he's in opposition. AKP has been in power to 20 years. How can he be responsible of the inflation? And they say, I don't know, but he is the one. So that is basically the pi pu uh, public perception and response. Okay, our next question is, in foreign policy, Erdogan seems to have no set principles, but rather just shifting opportunism. Does he have clear values or principles in domestic policy? Well, I refer to the foreign policy rather than opportunism. I say pragmatism, maybe I am more generous in that. 
no, domestically he 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 is a uh, he was uh, he didn't work on principle, but as I try to lay out by the strategies, kind of try to give different kind of. Uh, uh, deliver different things to different segments of the society and so and kind of co-opted them and rallied them behind um, the AKP. But lately, not anymore. It is very clear the policy positions against women's rights, against LGBT rights, against, again, the uh, uh, Kurdish um, uh, demands and uh, equality. Uh, so uh, the uh, it capitalizes in uh, what uh, some scholars refer as uh, uh, culture uh, policies and the uh, uh, triggers on people's cultural again the values and 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 so on and it is getting this like the the government and Erdogan is getting closer and closer to more conservative religious groups, uh, more again the uh, least uh, 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 educated people. And when you look at the voting uh, uh, distribution, that uh, his constituencies tend to be more rural or urban poor and uh, less educated uh, the um, segment that is religious what we may call like the turkey is considered to be 98 percent muslim that doesn't really it's not accurate there are a lot of people who are not followers of of, uh, of the religion but they were born to a Muslim family and they have such a recognition and identity, but they are, they don't move or act according to uh, uh, some religious perspective. But there are some people there. And within those, the uh, among the believers, a good portion is not supporting the AKP. So the according to some statistics that this uh religious uh, 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 conservative constituency of AKP is about 20%. But AKP gets my, more votes than, than that. But AKP caters to that core 20% more and more and ignore the uh, other religious groups I, uh, in fact. Our next question, uh, talk about Turkey's relationship with Russia. Erdogan seems to be one of the politicians who knows how to deal with Putin. I agree. <laughs> that is the, uh, I think they understand each other. So uh, they probably, again, this, as I mentioned on Syria, they're on the opposite sides. On uh, on Ukraine, the, the Turkey plays uh, both both ways, and uh, and uh, but they have certain uh, trade relations, and Russia provides uh, inexpensive uh, uh, energy uh, to uh, Turkey. So uh, yeah, in a way. Uh, uh, it is also that they both go by pragmatic uh, policy options. They are not buddies, but they are not enemies either. So some in some places they are uh, up in opposition. In some places, in some ways, they are um, in agreement. Is oh wait, I got a message from Peter. Yeah, we can get these last two comments. In. The next question is, is Erdogan actually regarded as a charismatic leader or does he stay in power primarily because there is no strong, coherent opposition? Both, I would say. Uh, there are some people who uh, actually uh, are very much attracted to his personality 
uh, he 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 is gifted in terms of uh, uh, oral speech and delivery. He's a good orator, and uh, and he um, uh, uh, actually when uh, in the first part of the program the. Uh, uh, Orban was mentioned as a kind of nice man. Uh, Erdogan is not a nice man, but he is this bold, uh, speaking recklessly sometimes, sometimes in a hurting manner, even toward his own constituency. But uh, people kind of go like this, like the uh, attracted to that, tough speaker, tough uh, uh, against the Europeans. Uh, tough against Americans and so on, they uh, uh, they are taken by that. So it is appealing to some segment of the society. And then one final question: Are you safe in Turkey? Actively objecting to the government? That is a tough question, and here I am going to reveal something about myself. I showed you some pictures about uh, bomb uh, pro uh, Kurdish majority areas in 2015. And in response to that, there was a campaign among the academics and it's called uh, Academics for Peace. And I was within that group and we issued a statement. Actually, some other people wrote a the statement. They just brought it to me to sign. And we basically said there that the, we are not going to be a party to this massacre and invited the uh, uh, government to go back to dialogue and peace initiatives instead of bombing uh, Kurdish majority areas. And we were first accused of terrorism and then the charge was changed when it became more official. Uh, the uh, it was abating terrorism. And although we were over 2,000 people, about 300 of us were uh, actually prosecuted. And finally, the uh, Constitutional Court uh, reached the decision that we were using our um, freedom of uh, expression. We didn't commit any uh, crime. But uh, this is a method uh, that is used. You can be selectively subject to prosecution. And, uh, uh, but another thing that is, I should name for about that group, those of us who lived uh, abroad, worked abroad, although some of us were prosecuted, we were immune to uh, direct action on our jobs by the KP, but some other academics were dismissed from their jobs and they could not find jobs anywhere else. Nobody would hire them. And despite the constitutional court decision, we have about uh, 350 to 400 uh, academics still not uh, uh, basically instituted, uh, uh, assigned back to their uh, jobs. They are, they lost their jobs. Yes, it is like a lottery because you don't know on whom they're going to act when, but yeah, if you speak against the government, you're not safe. Well, if I could jump in at this point, uh, we're a little bit past our anticipated stop time, but uh, that's okay. I want to thank you, Zara, for a very fine presentation. I was uh, impressed by how much you know about uh, Turkish political history. Uh, very impressive in uh, showing how these things lead to the current situation the background of the AKP party and the, and the power struggles within the party and then what emerged from all of that. So all of that was very impressive. 
And we certainly thank you very much for uh, enlightening us on this subject. Well, I would thank you for this wonderful opportunity. And I don't know if I can save chat, but I would like to uh, see some of the questions. And if people would like to write uh, to me, please uh, uh, feel free to do so. If uh, there were some burning questions that you didn't get to ask. And I'm not sure how quickly I would respond, but I would try to respond. Well, that's very, very generous of you. Uh, if people don't know your email address, they can they can uh, Google you at the university. Yeah, Kentucky. very disliked. I have only uh, one public <laughs> email, so they can find me easily. Well, thank you all very much. Uh, and we hope that all of you, plus your friends, will join us next week when we hear a discussion about uh, about India and uh, Narendra Modi. So, uh, Zara Arat, thank you for your presentation, and, and everyone, good evening. Thank you. It was my pleasure. Uh, good night.